let's talk about a new bladder. So a new bladder is a, a urinary diversion that uh, uses a longer portion of that distal ileum, that you know, that small bowel that I showed you, and basically um, takes that long tube and re-sews it into a sphere. And what the goal here is um, uh, is uh, to what the fancy term is detubularize, which is basically kind of uh, reconnect that bowel in such a way that you make the spherical reservoir, which is the spherical shape sort of bl new bladder that uh, is going to store urine instead of one's native's bladder. The new bladder is, uh, is, is not a new diversion. It's been around for many de for decades, and um, uh, it works when it works incredibly well. So the, this is what I'm showing you is a, is a Studer new bladder. Uh, Ernst Studer described this arrangement, and it has this what's called an afferent limb. It has this portion of bowel that the ureters are sewn into, and this bowel here uh, pushes urine into the pouch itself. So uh, basically, this portion of the bladder uh, bowel kind of squeezes the urine in. It, you know, the bowel doesn't know that it's now uh, that it's now uh, storing urine, so it just kind of keeps doing what uh, it was doing before it was cut away from um, from its original sort of purpose. And as urine enters this area, it gets pushed into the uh, the reservoir here. So the knee bladder is sewn to the urethra and sewn into the ureters. And here I'm showing in on, on, on a female patient, some, some surgeons try to avoid knee bladders in female patients for a couple of reasons. One, there is a suture line on the, on the vagina that's, uh, that often is present uh, when the vagina is closed, and there's suture line on this, uh, on this bowel. And there's about a, uh, th there, there is a little risk, there's about a 5% risk for forming what's called a new bladder vaginal fistula. This is uh, basically a connection between the vagina and the new bladder that's very, very hard to repair. So a lot of surgeons who do new bladders in women try to do a vaginal sparing approach where there's no uh, suture line on the vagina. But if, you, if the uterus needs to be taken, then that, you know, that's a necessary suture line. So it's important to discuss that risk with your surgeon when, when one's choosing a urinary diversion. Now, the biggest... The biggest challenge in, in, uh, in our women patients with new bladders is that they become hypercontinent, which, which is that they can't empty their new bladders. And that's just related to kind of the geometry of the anatomy here in the new bladder. What we think happens is sort of, um, uh, sort of kinks off the outlet, and uh, it's very hard for, for women to empty their new bladders. About, you know, uh, if the estimates are about 30% of cases. And so women have to self-catheterize. And sometimes, especially for, uh, for elderly women, as their dexterity deteriorates, as you know, um, it's very difficult for them to do. And so that's one of the considerations, one of the things that needs to be considered when a new bladder is, is, is uh, being uh, considered in a woman, is whether you know, this risk of hypercontinence can that be managed. And so I will tell you why a lot of surgeons are more enthusiastic about a different type of continent diversion in women, and that's called an Indiana pouch, and I'll, um, I, will, um, I, will, I will go through that in a minute. In men, these uh, neobladders uh, work quite well. Um, there's still a risk of uh, hypercontinence, and, um, you know, that risk is probably is much less, but it still certainly happens. And men have to understand when they choose this diversion that there is a that there is a risk of, um, you know, needing lifelong self-catheterization if this diversion is chosen. And I, I certainly have met patients who just say, I just don't want to take that risk. I don't want to have to self-catheterize. That's something that's just not palatable to me. I, some, I sometimes try to uh, walk patients through a self-catheterization in the office to really show them that it's generally very, very manageable. It's not, um, uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, once people try it, I think they, generally say, oh, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. But, you know, some people certainly are very confident that's not something that they want to risk. Now, the more common issue with neobladders in men and in women is incontinence, is, um, um, is chances of leaking urine after surgery. So let me show you a sort of a picture here to kind of understand this better. So I'll go back to this image here. This is, the again, the anatomy where... This is the urethra. This is the tube that, you know, the urine goes out like this. It goes through the prostate 
uh, um, as it leaves the bladder. Um, and the sort of here is uh, the bladder and the prostate are removed and the new bladder is sewn here. So not, not the prettiest picture of a new bladder, but, she, uh, but th this is sort of shows us the new bladder with the ureter sewn in. And the challenge here is that this sphincter in, you know, this muscle that keeps men continent doesn't wake up uh, or doesn't recover full function after surgery, probably less than 10% 10 of patients, but uh, I, tell, I tell folks to kind of consider 10% as the risk that they're integrating into their decision. There's a 10% risk that when they cough, when they sneeze, when they pick up something heavy, that they have it's called stress urinary incontinence. They leak some urine despite every effort to preserve the sphincter. Now, 90% of folks don't, but, you know, there's, there, there is a small portion that do. And, you know, there are ways to fix it, but obviously it's, uh, it's another challenge that people have to overcome. And it's important to understand that almost everybody is wet in the beginning. When these new bladders are constructed, there's a catheter that gets put in into the urethra, and the new bladder is kept empty in order for all the suture lines to, to, uh, to heal. At about three weeks after surgery, um, we instill some contrast in here and take some pictures to make sure that everything is healed, and the catheter is then removed. Now, once the catheter is removed, the sphincter here doesn't recover right away. Most men, and almost everybody, uh, it takes weeks and sometimes months for the sphincter to really regain function, and, and men have to um, um, have to sort of live through that recovery, and it certainly is a challenge. They have to do Kegel exercises, which are these uh, muscle strengthening exercises to get their sphincter back in order. Um, but still, you know, uh, let's say approximately 10% of men have some leakage after the surgery, and that's during the day. Now, what happens in patients, uh, what happens in, in, in people, when they sleep is that there is um, there's a reflex that when a native bladder when when one's bladder is full and it stretches it sends a it's, there's a spinal reflex that goes to the spinal cord and then the spinal cord sends a reflex to the sphincter to tighten up so as the bladder fills the sphincter tightens it's a that's a spinal reflex that we all have when the bladder is removed um, and even though we put in a new bladder, that spinal reflex is not there. And so what happens is we, after a new bladder, we're at the mercy of sort of what this sphincter is doing on its own without a spinal reflex. So in about 20% of men, when this new bladder fills and they're sleeping, they leak. Although they may be perfectly dry during the day, their sphincter is just too relaxed when they're sleeping. So it's very important to understand that challenge uh, that um, there is a risk of what's called nighttime incontinence um, is, in, in men who choose new bladders. So again, an additional challenge to consider when you're picking this urinary diversion. Now, this obviously, I mentioned it, but just to mention it again, this, this urinary diversion requires longer surgery, it requires more suture lines, requires more drains to uh, when, when uh, uh, following surgery. Let me walk you through that a little bit and walk you through the drains because I think those are, those are important to understand. The drains, so let's, let's go back to, to this picture here. So if somebody, um, this, I'm just going to show you sort of uh, how a neobladder patient uh, looks in my practice. I've, um, I, I do uh, surgery both the traditional open way and uh, robotics, although to be honest with you, there's been a randomized trial showing that robotics uh, doesn't have the advantage that we thought it had in uh, the bladder space. And although I do just about everything else robotically, I, in the last uh, year and a half, I've, I've been doing all my surgeries in an open fashion. I just think they're faster and, uh, you know, that's a personal preference. I walk my patients through. Some patients still say they want it robotically and I do it robotically. But uh, in general, I, I, I do it in an, in an open fashion. Just uh, I think it's... Uh, it's a little, honestly a little bit easier on the patient as they're uh, just quicker surgeries. But let me just show you what a the drains uh, look like in patients with, that wake up with a neobladder. So those stents, those diversion stents that I showed you, uh, 
they're still here, and I bring them out uh, over on the side here. And actually, when patients wake up, they still have an ostomy bag. They have an ostomy bag that that uh, helps drain these stents. And now these stents, about two weeks out, they, they, they're removed. So this, this ostomy comes back two weeks out. Now, there is uh, also a catheter that I showed you in the other picture. It's obviously a catheter that comes out over here. Now, it, a little bit depends, but generally I leave uh, a superpubic tube, which is a, a tube that um, comes out um, usually on this side right under the bag that also drains the meal bladder. So um, just to make sure that if the catheter clogs, this is a, a little bit of a pop-off valve, okay? And then there is the drain, which is the JP drain. So people wake up after a meal bladder with quite a few drains. And what I take out first is I take out the JP drain first. Then I generally take out the stents. Then if about three weeks later, I take out the catheter. And when the catheter is out, I clamp the suprapubic tube and I sort of let people get used to uh, voiding with their new bladders and keep this for a week as kind of a safety net, and then this comes out. So as you can see, it takes a, approximately a month to get all your drains out after your new bladder, whereas this process is much quicker after uh, an, ileo, you know, an ileo conduit. And it, again, important to understand these trade-offs. Definitely a much bigger a much more complex perioperative uh, recovery uh, even in the easiest case scenario after a new bladder than after an ileal conduit. And, you know, honestly, for my elderly frail patients, I really discourage them from going through this operation. This is, this is sometimes just a bit too intense for patients that are, you know, uh, that are too frail to, uh, uh, to have this amount of surgery. Let me go back and walk you through the third type of urinary diversion which is um, an Indiana pouch. Now, before I, before I go to that, I want to just talk about a couple of, um, couple of scenarios where, you know, when somebody chooses a neobladder urinary diversion, you know, I tell folks that there's three reasons why they may wake up and they may have a different urinary diversion. We need to decide which urinary diversion that would be if they can't get a neobladder. So why can't somebody get a neobladder? So one of the reasons somebody can't get a neobladder if there's cancer at the urethral edge, at the urethral margin, where the prostate meets the urethra, if there's cancer, patients will need a urethrectomy, the removal of their urethra, or at least removal of part of their urethra that's involved right there. So they, they can't have a neobladder then. I personally, and again, this is a little bit of a surgical preference, and some people debate this, I personally generally try to avoid a neobladder if patients have a lot of disease. If I get in and there is really just a, a lot of disease where I think Patients are going to need systemic therapy very quickly uh, after after the surgery. Where I worry that we're really battling uh, some big oncologic issues here, where you know there's some very bulky lymph nodes and or you know some other disease that uh, it maybe is unresectable. Then you know I, my personal opinion is a new bladder uh, prolongs one's recovery and locks one out potentially of some systemic therapy. Now again, surgeons differ on this, but this is why I tell my patients that. You know, in that scenario, I generally won't do a neobladder. And the third scenario where a neobladder won't be done is, um, is if the anesthesiologist, and this is rare, but if the anesthesiologists are worried about that something is happening, like a heart attack or, you know, lungs are filling with fluid or something where we need to just get, get the surgery done as quickly as possible, then, you know, patients who have chosen a neobladder may wake up with a different urine diversion. I think that's important to discuss. Now, I generally tell folks, you know, that who have a positive urethral margin that they need to decide beforehand that either they're going to have go back to, you know, the old ileal conduit or they can have another urinary diversion called an um, Indiana pouch. Now, um, and we decide that beforehand and sort of I, I document their decisions. So in, in the rare cases when this comes up, I, I know exactly what to do um, and what their wishes are. 